Okay, good morning everybody and pleasure to be here with you. So indeed I'm I'm the team leader for the AI Act, so I've been involved in the drafting and the negotiation of the AI Act since the beginning. Um, so as you know now right now we are in the final stages of finalization of this uh, legislation. So my goal today is to give you in about 10 minutes or so a bit an overview of what are the key elements of uh, this piece of legislation which undoubtedly will uh, have an impact in, in Europe in many respects, and uh, you know, perhaps we have time. With Arlo. I don't have a watch with me, but so you tell me if I'm going a bit uh, outside time, and so that we can have also questions if there are. So, first of all, the risk based approach. I think this is really the key idea behind the IA when we submitted the proposal. The key idea was to not regulate the technology as such, but to regulate indeed use cases. And why? Because use cases are different and risks are different. So we want to therefore to make sure that the rules that we put in place are different depending on the type of risk that the system can create. So we categorize essentially systems according to, I would say four slash three, categories in the sense of the fourth one, so the cases where AI systems pose minimal or no risk, essentially the regulation does not foresee extra rules. So there's only voluntary application of certain rules, but no binding rules. So that's why it's kind of three slash four. So the regulation focuses on the first, say, therefore, three levels. Uh, and I would say that 80%, actually now this, the percentage is a bit shifted, through the negotiation. Initially, it was 95% of the routes were on high risk. And now I would say probably we got down to 80 because we have other routes as well. But so just going back a bit to the initial thinking. So three layers of risk, cases where we have an acceptable type of risk, then the regulatory response is a provision. An example, we'll see them a little bit more detail, would be some, for instance, social scoring. High risk, as I said, was the, the initial, the core of the AI Act. These are cases where AI poses risk that can, can be addressed and mitigated through specific rules, notably by subjecting the AI system to certain ex ante requirements, so compliance with the requirements, for instance, in relation to the data sets, in relation to the human website, technical documentation, so to ensure that, that once they are placed on the market, that they are trustworthy. And uh, indeed, an ex-ante conformity assessment. So before the system is placed on the market, we want to make sure that it's trustworthy, it's reliable, and therefore um, there's a procedure to verify that. Uh, and this is associated with the use of the CMARC. So the CMARC is probably something you're familiar with. In new legislation, most products have a CMARC, which means it signals that the product is in line with applicable EU law. Then we have another category, is those cases where systems uh, pose some sort of risk related to their lack of disclosure, I would say, or transparency. So they're not high risk, but not even low risk, so to say, but somewhat related to the lack of uh, understanding. Like, for instance, we're interacting with a chatbot, we want to make sure that we are informed that we're interacting with a chatbot, so with a machine, as opposed to uh, another human. So here, we, we go one by one each category, and then we'll spend the uh, last two slides with on governance and, uh, and next steps. So, in terms of prohibited AI, you see here the column on the left are the initial proposal of the Commission. So, we had foreseen four use cases of prohibited AI. And in the text that is uh, in the final stages of approval after the institution negotiation, we're going to have four more. At the same time, some of the provisions that we had uh, identified in the proposal have been a bit extended. For instance, when it comes to the first one, the first and the second, so the use of AI that for uh, manipulation or deceptive, uh, use of deceptive uh, approaches or exploitation of vulnerabilities, we initially had foreseen the provision only when the harm can be physical or psychological. Now we, are, we have expanded a bit the type of provision to a broader set of harm, so significant harm. Um, also, the social scoring initially was thought in relation only to 
public authorities as opposed to private authorities. And now we have a bit of extension also to private authorities. The last one is about the use, the real-time remote biometric identification. It's really one of the most sensitive use cases that have been discussed. <coughs> it essentially relates to the use by the police authorities in public accessible spaces uh, of real-time remote biometric identification systems. So whereby police can, uh, for instance, immediately um, verify a match real-time of a person, for instance, walking the street. Um, this is the only use cases that is prohibited, but with some exceptions. So there are situations where it's possible to use those systems, but there must be certain conditions met. Uh, so the other cases on the right-hand side, you see they were added during the negotiations. So now we have a provision for certain types of biometric categorization, which will lead to infer certain type of information about individuals, like for instance, race, political opinions, trade union. It, it's essentially a form of profiling. Uh, that is prohibited. Uh, individual criminal risk assessment. Uh, also emotional recognition in certain contexts, not only in workplace or education, unless there is a motivation linked to uh, medical or safety reasons. And the last use case has been added is the untargeted scraping of internet of CCTV uh, facial images to build uh, or expand the data set. So when it comes to high risk, uh, this fundamentally didn't change much, except that we're going to have some more use cases when it comes to the <coughs> second market, the second category, so the standalone. So, but to give you a sense of the, the structure, so the high risk classification where our system depends on two conditions. The first category of high risk AI systems are <laughs> those cases where the AI is a safety component of a product that is already subject to EU legislation. To give you an example, like medical devices, machinery, toys, rad equipment, we are dealing with a number of fiscal products that are already regulated in EU law, but they don't have, let's say, specific rules regarding their software components or AI components. So an AI system that is a component of those products becomes high risk when the product in itself, when the whole medical device or the whole machinery is subject according to the sectorial legislation to uh, a third party certification system. So not all products are subject to third party certification systems. Those that are, let's say, more risky are subject to third party certification systems. So what we've done with the I Act is try to align the classification of the I that is a component of that product to the classification of the product. As well. um, the second category of high-risk AI systems are a number of explicitly defined systems that are used in, broadly speaking, eight areas of activity. You see the areas are quite broad, like principal enforcement, education, vocational training, but I, we, I didn't, couldn't put the whole annex here because it would be too much, but under each category there are specifically listed use cases. So for instance, in the case of education and vocational training, systems used to admit students to university or education institutions. So not the whole sector is high risk, only a number of use cases under each sector are high risk. And so there is a specific list in the annex three. And so these are the, 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 the whole, the way in which systems become high risk. Once they are high risk, as I said, they are subject to rules regarding compliance with the requirement and conformity assessment. And here's about the, the third and fourth level. So link to systems where we have an issue around transparency. The first three use case for transparency obligations were already in the commission proposal. Not only that humans should be notified when are interacting with an AI system unless this is obvious or evident. Uh, an obligation to notify humans that are exposed to emotional recognition of biometric categorization systems. These are actually being turned. So they, there is a main, it remains an obligation to notify, but those systems, emotional recognition and biometric categorization, have also, now are also high risk. Then we have an obligation for uh, users of AI systems to label uh, defects, or so audio or, or video content that would be generated by AI. And during the negotiations, there have been further additions, notably 
essentially an obligation for providers of generative AI to uh, essentially allow the detection of the generated content through some form of watermarking or other forms of detection. This is not the only option, of course. Watermarking. We know watermarking is one of them, but it's not the only one. And we know none of this is actually really working 100%. And the second use case is added was an obligation to label, so for the user, uh, artificially generated text when the purpose is to essentially inform the public. This is another important deviation or variation from the initial commission proposal. The commission proposal didn't focus on, let's say, general purpose AI systems or general purpose AI models. During the negotiations, there has been a heated discussion around uh, adding new rules. Uh, this is more the type of models that, um, you know, for being giving an example, could be like GPT-4 behind ChatGPT. And uh, what was decided is to have a two-tier approach. So essentially create a lower tier where those models are subject to a number of obligations, notably technical documentation, that could include information around the computational resources used, so the clocks, energy consumption, information downstream, so the, the providers who, or the further downstream pro developers who want to use those models for integrating their product need to be informed, and uh, rules about copyright, so to enforce copyright obligations. In particular, uh, providers of those models have to have a policy in place to demonstrate how they comply with new copyright law and published a, a summary of the content used for training. The second category is about uh, those models that are supposed to be more impactful, uh, so because of their capabilities. So they are classified as general purpose AI models with systemic risks. The classification is linked to the number of flops, 10 to 25, uh, or other criteria, there is, there is, a, there is a whole annex uh, following a designation by the ad office, which will be part of uh, the commission. And here, the risk obligations are more intensive. So the obligations are more intensive. We're going to have, on top of what we've seen before for the general purpose and models, obligation on risk assessment and mitigation, incident reporting, and also uh, level of cyber security. Uh, an important information is that these rules would apply also to open source models, with the exception of technical documentation and transparency for uh, the lower tier. And um, another important aspect around the governance for this uh, new chapter is about the possibility to develop code of practice to ensure compliance um, of this quite, quite new area of, um, uh, I would say, products that are being, becoming available on the market. Uh, this is a bit the governance structure. So we have national competent authorities that are responsible for conformity assessment and market surveillance. This remains. So primarily enforcement of EU law relies on member states. So national competent authorities will have a key role. But we have introduced also a new level type of enforcement. So that's why there is a new AI office, which is part of the commission. Uh, which will be responsible for enforcing and supervising the rules for the general purpose models, what we just discussed. Um, and also, uh, can also assist the member states when necessary. On top of that, we're going to have an AI board where representatives of the member states will sit together uh, in advising and assisting the commission. An advisory forum, which will be a forum for stakeholders, essentially. And a scientific panel, which will be composed of independent experts, which support the commission in enforcing the rules on general purpose AI models, and also can be used by the member states uh, when needed. Uh, this is a bit the last slide and the, the, the entry into application of the rule. Uh, so once the AI Act entry into force, which happens 15 days or 14 days after the actual adoption, there is this, a gradual or progressive entry into application of the rules. So the first rules to enter into application will be the prohibited, regarding prohibited AI after six months. After 12 months, we have the rules on general purpose AI models. 
And then after 24 months is most, most other routes will enter into faults, essentially all the rest, uh, with the exception of uh, the routes regarding high risk care system for Annex 2, which are the prohibits. So I'll stop it here if there is any question. Can I have a question? So the, the enforcement of the GDPR is hampered by the fact that some member states are lax. How is this risk mitigated here? So here we, the IAC relies on the so-called uh, principle of country of destination, country of destination, not country of origin. So GDPR, some of the shortcomings of the GDPR uh, are related to the fact that the, the enforcement of GDPR is anchored to the data protection authority of where the data processor is based. And that's, that's why it's called country of origin. So, to give you an example, Meta is based in Ireland. Yes. Therefore, we have the Irish Data Protection Authority responsible for that. Across the EU, primarily. That's why it's called country of origin. So, the origin where the provider is based. The IAC relies on a different logic, it's called country of destination, meaning all market surveillance authorities in the member states can intervene in case an AI system in their market creates an issue for compliance. But there are, of course, mechanisms to ensure a union, uh, let's say, um, dialogue and alignment if needed. There's, there is a concept of so called union safeguard procedure. So, typically, what happens is that, for instance, if there's a medical device that has an issue in one country, there is a system of notification whereby the market surveillance authority of country one can notify that there is a problem with certain medical device. All other countries are informed. They can enter into consultation and agree on a certain common line. Or if they disagree, ultimately the commission can decide. Thank you. So I have a question regarding the Clobi AI comments. How uh, active is the EU regarding Clobi AI comments? So we are quite active in the sense that um, we have a uh, number of initiatives that um, where the EU has participated. Um, some of them are more, let's say, legal nature. Some of them are more policy oriented, like for instance, the G7, the Hiroshima process, the EU has been part of that process. The EU is of course sitting as an observer in the OECD. Uh, OECD also, again, doesn't really uh, deal with regulation, uh, but deals with a number of also conceptual issues around AI, like for instance, the definition of AI that we have adopted in the AI Act is very much inspired by the work of the OECD. Um, there is also the Council of Europe. Council of Europe uh, is uh, working on a treaty around uh, AI, and the EU is negotiating on behalf of the member states of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, um, and that is going to be a treaty that of course goes beyond the, the, the boundaries of EU, strictly speaking, because it's, it's larger. Then, of course, we have quite strong bilateral conversations with the US through the Trade and Technology Council. And in general, we are quite act active um, in a bilateral relationship. So I have to say I've been mostly focusing on the on the internal dimension of the AI Act. And now that if the day act is coming to a conclusion, of course, it would be also easier for us to, to engage uh, internationally. As opposed to before, without knowing exactly the direction of travel domestically, it would be much more difficult to say how much we can commit externally. Uh, if, if an uh, AI system is, uh, is something that would be high risk, uh, but then uh, how is the development uh, uh, of that system uh, regulated. So the, the, there needs to be ex uh before deployment, but uh, uh, what, are the, what is the act uh, saying about that uh, research and development uh, process? So the research and development is excluded from the scope because this is a product legislation, which means you, we regulate the product as it is placed on the market. Uh, of course, some of the obligations are considered documentation are related to your development process. But you're not obliged to do that until you know that you want to place it on the market. 
So if you don't place the product on the market, you're not subject to any rules. The moment you place it on the market, then you have to ensure you know, documentation, transparency, traceability. So in a way, research and development is not regulated per se. But on the other hand, if you want to ensure meaningful compliance, documentation is the case in point, you, you must think about your research development process. Of course, you're not doing this for the purpose of, you know, maybe universities just do it for the purpose of research, but companies do it ultimately product-oriented research. So in that case, you have to put yourself in the mindset of preparing your own compliance the moment you decide to sell your product. So, yeah, la 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 last, last question, maybe the short, short answer. Yeah, I have a short question. Uh, how rely uh, the member states on the AI regulation? <laughs> sometimes there is a diversity of opinions within the EU. Um, I, I, I cannot comment too much on this. <laughs> <laughs> I can only say, I can only say the fact that uh, the last uh, second of February there has been a, an endorsement of this. Agreed. Agreed. Unanimous. Okay, thank you, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, I think that's uh, worth, of, worth of applause. Uh, <laughs>